Welcome to Employing Open Access LCMS in Support of Recombinant Protein Drug Development. I'm Tamla Oliver, Managing Editor of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. I suspect, based on the fact that you've signed up for and are listening to this webinar today, that you're looking for new ways to confirm protein identity and modifications and, or possibly or, you're considering the use of LCMS in a manufacturing setting. You're definitely in the right place by tuning in today. This webinar will address those issues and more. Our first speaker is Gurmil Jendi. He is Senior Segment Manager, Biopharma and Biosimilars at Agilent. He will introduce Agilent's open access or walk-up solutions. His brief overview will be followed by a more in-depth presentation by Eric Fang, scientist, protein sciences at Novartis. Eric will talk about his group's experience deploying an open access LCMS platform to analyze their recombinant proteins. Before Grimmel starts, though, I want to encourage you to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We'll answer as many questions as we can. Simply type your question into the Ask a Question box when you have one and hit Submit. Um, Grimmel, we are ready to yes. get started. Thank you, Tamalyn. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this seminar on the application of open access mass spectrometry in the support of protein drug development and production. There are three main parts to my presentation today. First, I'll start with some trends in the biopharmaceutical industry that is driving the need to increase productivity in the protein analytical groups. Second, I'll briefly touch on the open concept of open access in analytical labs. And third, I will conclude by describing the Agilent Mass Hunter walk-up software, an interface for open access mass spectrometry for our LCTOF and QTOF systems for biopharma workflows. I want to start by sharing a slide on the typical biologics manufacturing process. Unlike in the small molecule drug production, biologics manufacturing is a highly complex process with many different functions, starting with biomarker identification and validation. This is followed by drug discovery and development against the drug target. And in the case when the drug is a monoclonal antibody, it will involve establishing a monoclonal antibody generation platform like transgenic mice or fish display platforms. The human genes produced from these platforms are then used for cell line transformation and cloning, followed by high throughput screening and selection to shortlist clone candidates that produce the desired biologic with the highest quality and safety attributes. The production process includes cell culture fermentation optimization and scale up, downstream processing and purification strategy development, formulation development, and the various phases of clinical trials before the biotherapeutic finally makes it to the market. Each stage of the complex manufacturing process confers a unique property onto the product, and to ensure that the product has the desired properties and quality, as well as ensuring manufacturing consistency, Samples are tested at every step of the process. Samples from the different steps in the process are typically submitted to centralized analytical groups. These analytical groups are tasked with developing and qualifying methods for the different functions, and in many cases, run the various assays for them. The analytical groups are also responsible for methods transfer to other functions, such as QAQC groups, which are typically tied to manufacturing and product release. The analytical groups perform a range of different tests, and testing is usually classified based on the end purpose of the groups submitting the samples. For example, product characterization, stability studies, or lot release. Product characterization testing, which includes product identification such as intact mass analysis and amino acid sequence determination, is critical to confirm that the right product was produced in order for the program to move forward. If the product is glycosylated, glycan profiling or glycan structure determination will need to be performed. Product characterization also includes determination of all critical quality attributes such as size and charge heterogeneity and identification and characterization of major post-translational modifications. In addition to this, when samples are submitted by functions such as cell culture and purification development groups, 
the analytical groups also requested to perform additional assays such as media and process re related impurity analysis. In short, analytical groups in biopharma have to develop and support many different testing methods. And given the complexity of the biopharmaceutical products, such as monoclonal antibodies, makes their work even more difficult. To make matters worse for these analytical groups, there are several trends that are increasing the number of samples submitted for analysis. This includes, one, an increase in the number of candidate drugs in the pipeline as pharma shifts from small molecules to biologics. Second, there is an increased adoption of high throughput automation solutions for programs such as clone selection and formulation screening that is moving the bottleneck to analytical characterization. And third, as I implied earlier, the biologics manufacturing process is highly complex and to comply with QBD or quality by design paradigm shift in the industry, more and more samples are submitted at every step for testing. As a result of these trends, analytical facilities have been asked to run more samples, many of which are very routine and with fewer resources. Hands-on time is often cited as one of the most important factors that determines the volume of work analytical groups can accomplish with a given number of people, and analytical scientists have to find ways to do more with less to meet the demand without impacting the quality of their work. This in turn is making open access systems more important at analytical facilities, creating an environment where end users walk up to systems and submit their own samples for analysis and rely less on trained specialists for routine analysis. Open access in analytical lab is not an entirely new concept and has been widely used in other more matured industries like the pharmaceutical industry and the applied markets where open access or walk-up solutions have been developed for the routine use of GC, LC, MassPAC, and NMR. In an open access environment, systems are typically maintained and administered by trained users. Samples are submitted by users not familiar with the operation and principles of the system. The open access software which is the main interface between the user and the system, exposes the user to a limited set of choices and allows many users to obtain useful data without relying on the availability of the limited analytical resources. At Agilent, we are partnering with the biopharma industry to innovate and commercialize open access or walk-up solutions for routine biopharma workflows and quality control. Some of the open access solutions that we have developed include walk-up automated sample prep for peptide mapping and glycan analysis, walk-up 2D LC setups for online impurity analysis by MassPAC, and walk-up LCMS solutions for routine biopharma applications such as intact mass analysis, sequence confirmation, and post-translational modification analysis, which is the focus of today's webinar. On this slide, I want to describe the Agilent Mass Hunter Open Access LCMS software for biopharma. It is a simplified user interface that allows lab managers to maintain a multi-instrument LC and LCMS facility where users new or not trained in chromatography or mass spectrometry can run their own samples. It requires one skilled user for setup and administration. This Super user will create and optimize methods, add users, schedule maintenance, and is able to update protocols from any PC in the lab, even from the administrator's desk. Sample submitters merely enter sample information and select a method and any method parameters applicable to their analysis and skill level. Once the run is complete, results are automatically generated and emailed to the submitter. One key benefit of the open access environment is that it allows multiple users to get equal access to the instrument, regardless of their skill levels. It is easy to switch between methods. This ensures maximum productivity, and the open access software can be configured to match lab standard operating procedures. The key value proposition of the Agilent Mass Hunter Open Access LCMS solution is that it offers lab managers of analytical facilities that have been asked to run more samples but have limited resources, a very compelling 
easy to set up and maintain walk-up LCMS platforms that enable users to easily submit samples and get useful data with little prior understanding of chromatography or mass spec and still guarantee the systems have a high uptime. Eric will cover some of the real-world open access biopharma applications in more details after my presentation, but in short, the Agilence Open Access LCMS workflow solutions allows biologists, for example, that express proteins a mean to rapidly and confidently confirm that they have expressed their proteins with the right mass and sequence before proceeding with further downstream processing and testing. Purification scientists that purify proteins can analyze purity at every step and from batch to batch. This slide shows the simplified user interface on the Agilent Mass Hunter Biopharma Walkup LCMS software. It starts with sample submission in three simple steps. The user logs into his account in step one. In step two, the user enters sample information and chooses a method for the analysis from an administrator approved list of methods. In step three, the user places samples into the auto sampler at locations directed by the software. Once the analysis is complete, the software is configured to send an email to the user with the report and data. The customized report contains data file name, sample name, position of the sample, the method used for the acquisition and data analysis. The Agilent Mass Hunter BioConfirm software provides automated data extraction, deconvolution to zero charge, and protein confirmation. The reports will show table of match sequence of proteins and also a compound table showing different molecule species of the protein and their relative abundance. It also contains the total ion chromatogram trace and total compound chromatogram for compounds identified. The customized report shown here, for example, shows the result of the match sequence and identified protein for a preclinical sample. The report also includes the impurities that were not matched with the protein for its intact mass or any other known protein modifications, suggesting some process-related impurities in the sample. In this case, the report helps the researcher to optimize purification method or process so as to remove the unwanted impurities in the next cycle of operations. This slide shows simplified method setup interface within the Mass Hunter Walkup software where the administrator can easily set up open access methods. The interface also includes the ability to bring up any LC or mass pack methods for reviewing and editing. If the open access system runs into any technical problems, the administrator will receive an email indicating that the instrument needs attention. The administrator could remotely take the instrument offline, stop new sample submission, and schedule the necessary maintenance. In summary, Agilent has three LCMS instruments that are sold primarily to the biopharma markets, the single quad, time of flight, and quadruple time of flight. These are used at different stages of the biologics development process. In addition, we have a glycochip for the analysis of glycans attached to monoclonal antibodies. For software, we have our bioconfirm software for the confirmation of biologics and our open access mass hunter walk-up software that allows non-mass spec experts to focus on their biotherapeutic product and not on how to run a mass spec. That was the end of my part. Thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks, Camille. And again, I want to remind you about submitting those questions at the end. It's as simple as uh, submitting a question through the Ask a Question box and hitting Enter. Eric, um, we're ready for you. Thanks a lot, Tamlin. Uh, thanks to uh, Genetic Engineering News and uh, Agilent for inviting me to speak today. And thanks, Germo, for that introduction to Agilent's walk-up software. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. My name is Eric Fang, and I'm a scientist in the Protein Sciences Group here at uh, the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research in Emeryville. Our site is uh, devoted primarily to oncology and infectious diseases drug discovery. As an overview of my talk today, I'll, what I'll cover is uh, recombinant protein production at the research stage in drug discovery and uh, the protein production workflow. 
the intact protein LCMS workflow and its role as a primary QC criterion and characterization tool, and advantages of open access approach over uh, an analyst-based sample submission workflow. And finally, I'll cover some application case studies where open access has contributed directly to usability and, as a result, project success. The role of the Protein Sciences Group and of similarly situated groups or personnel within drug discovery research is to produce well-characterized proteins for various research purposes, among which are uh, enzymes and protein substrates for biochemical screening, protein for structural work such as crystallography and NMR, and more and more common these days are biophysical methods such as uh, surface plasmon resonance and differential scanning fluorimetry. Also very common today are antibody discovery efforts including the protein targets for the antibodies, as well as the antibodies themselves. Antibodies fall into the broader category of therapeutic protein candidates, other types of which we sometimes also make. Let me give you a quick rundown of the recombinant protein production workflow in our group. We have found through hard experience that it makes sense to locate this work uh, outside of project biology teams and into our dedicated group. First, uh, we design the proteins, meaning uh, what protein primary sequence we want to get in the end and what kind of features we want to introduce, such as tags or fusion proteins uh, and mutants of the protein. Then we do the molecular biology where we construct a plasmid or expression vector uh, DNA sequence that yields the desired protein sequence. We use their usual repertory of DNA techniques, PCR and site-directed mutagenesis, what have you. It's at this stage that the most common primary QC step occurs, sequencing of the DNA expression cassette to confirm the expected sequence. Sometimes this is the only check prior to functional assays or use of the protein products. Expression and purification follow, and it's at this stage that a second primary QC step can occur, that is, the uh, verification of the expected intact mass by LCMS. So let me go over the basic manual intact protein LCMS workflow in case you're not familiar with it. There's a workflow diagram at the top of this slide. You start out with a typical sample prep, including loading your vials or plates, placing them in the auto sampler, and then entering sample info into a queue. Once data acquisition has occurred, you would go back and open the LCMS result file Examine the total ion chromatogram, or TIC, identify peaks of interest, and extract the M over Z spectra. Here in the top panel, I show the simplest TIC possible, a single peak from a pure protein, and then I've extracted an M over Z spectrum shown in the middle panel. From this spectrum, I perform a zero-charge mass deconvolution, which gives me a final protein intact mass spectrum. In manual mode, you'd enter variety variety of parameters covering the MRZ range and the reconstruction range and wait for the data to process, which might take, say, 60 seconds, and do this for each of your peaks of interest. The result is the zero-charge mass deconvolution, as I said, as shown at the bottom, where you can identify the proteins in your peak. At that point, you'd be ready to convert the observed mass to the calculated mass of your protein of interest. The reason this is useful is because once you've an expected protein primary sequence resulting from your design and expression process, you can calculate accurately the expected average mass of the resulting protein. If you match your observed mass with the expected mass, you have some confidence that your overall process went as expected. Here I'm using myoglobin as an example. The myoglobin observed match here matches the target mass calculated from the known sequence, so I'm pretty pleased and I feel good that I have my expected product. In general, you use average mass because the large number of carbon atoms and the instrument resolution less than, say, 20,000 will no longer allow you to resolve the individual isotope peaks. I want to point out here also that the table highlighted in green along with the zoomed spectrum of the target peak is the product of a fully automated data analysis and annotation process that we've implemented here under the open access framework. Intact mass is particularly useful when it's necessary to confirm the presence of particular post-translational modifications, or PTMs. The cartoon construct design I show at the top of this slide includes a number of features. The target protein is in green, and this target I expect and desire to be monophosphorylated because in this case I've co-expressed it with a particular 
specific activating kinase. The AVTAG sequence in yellow, which provides a uh, site-specific biotinylation target for a biotin ligase enzyme. And I want the biotinylation to occur because I plan to use it in a downstream application. And if it isn't biotinylated or only partially biotinylated, this is going to affect its performance negatively. In pink, I've got the N-terminal histag along with the TEV protease cleavage site for subsequent removal of the tag. I have also noted the possibility of N-terminal variants. Um, these N-terminal variants are common PTMs that we see in recombinant protein work. They are often inconsequential, but sometimes they can cause variation in analytical methods, and it's useful to, to know what's there so that you can decide whether or not you want to worry about it. Note again here that the highlighted green table in the middle is a product of our automated data analysis and annotation workflow. I've highlighted the annotations in particular, confirming phosphorylation, loss of N-terminal methionine, and biotinylation with the red box. So I'm happy in this case. Besides characterizing the product, intact protein LCMS can be useful as a process tool. Any recombinant protein lab these days is going to make heavy use of uh, purification tags like 6-HIS, and very often they're engineered to have cleavable spe specific protease sites such as TEV or tobacco edge virus protease. Judicious use of affinity tags uh, greatly increases the productivity of a recombinant protein group. In cleaving the removable tag, it's often helpful to monitor the cleavage by mass spec. You can optimize for speedy cleavage or high cleavage yield. You can also confirm that the expected PTMs are retained after the tag removal. Overall, it's really quite helpful and fast as fast or faster than SDS page in many cases. If the system is available, meaning the LCMS system, it can often be faster. The data in this example is of the same construct as on the previous slide, and I've confirmed that I've removed the tag um, and that the phosphorylation and biotinylation remain on the main sequence. I just want to reiterate how important it is to provide a second QC step at the protein level, not just the DNA level. Occasionally, you'd see that despite apparent DNA sequence confirmation, you end up producing something else at the protein level. There's a lot of different reasons for this, and you don't always figure it out, but it's important to know. More often, there are mix-ups in handling between cloning and expression or between expression and purification. If the changes are relatively small, such as amino acid point mutations, small truncation variants, or my favorite example, uh, different IgG antibodies, you can't tell them apart on a gel. But you can usually tell by intact mass. Besides this, intact mass provides information about the overall post-translational modification state of your protein. Not all the PTMs you see will be designed by you, and it's useful to know about them. SCS page, Western blots, and activity assays are all still useful, but they usually fail to provide detailed information about the molecular state of your protein. Intact mass provides molecular detail embedded in the observed average mass of your protein sample, and combined with the workflow that you executed to arrive at that sample, uh, you have confidence in the identity of your protein product. To focus on antibodies for a moment, many labs are spending a lot of time producing IgG antibodies, a lot of different ones. Usually they have different primary sequences, and you can't see that on gel, as I mentioned. Many labs will confirm by affinity measurement, which is, of course, useful and desirable, but realistically, you don't have the same speed or resolution as reduced antibody intact mass would give you. You can confirm that expected primary sequence of both heavy and light chain if you have a known sequence. If you allow for stereotypical modifications like a pyroglutamate formation, lysine loss, and glycosylation. Without deglycosylation, you can do this really very quickly, just in minutes sometimes. Deglycosylation may or may not be necessary. It's generally helpful, though, because you reduce the uh, number of variations you have to consider. And you can do this all automatically in the data analysis uh, without further intervention after sample submission. So I've outlined intact masses usefulness in general role, but most of what I've shown doesn't depend on open access. You can do all of what I've talked about manually. I did note that some of my example data and annotations were taken from the output of a fully automated data analysis 
workflow. But really, what is open access and why do we want it? Germel did a nice job of outlining what it is, especially from the viewpoint of uh, therapeutic protein process development and manufacturing. Again, open access is a software work f framework that manages the overall analytical workflow and it allows end users to submit samples and receive data generally without the intervention of a skilled analyst. The degree of data analysis varies a lot and is something that I'll talk about here. You can also automate housekeeping tasks like calibrations and performance checks, which can also be a big help. At our site, uh, we've implemented open access system based on Agilent's easy access package along with Mass Hunter and BioConfirm for the protein analysis capabilities. And I should note that uh, within Novartis, other groups have a long history with open access, intact mass, and we've, we're grateful for the experience that they've shared with us here in Emeryville. When you set up open access or a walk-up system, you're really improving accessibility and ease of use for your method, in this case, intact protein LCMS. Accessibility and ease of use are really two sides of the same coin, and that coin is productivity. By making it easy for users to support themselves, it reduces demands on the skilled analysts. And by reducing demands on the skilled analysts, it really enables them to support more users, more samples, and perhaps more interestingly, more applications. The key thing is that automating the intact mass workflow saves a lot of time. The users take on the work of prepping and submitting their own samples. It's really less of a burden on them because it's their uh, own work on an as-needed basis. Acquisition has always been controlled by software, so open access doesn't really contribute here. But the pre-definition and pre-selection of robust methods by the analyst and presentation to end users by the open access software is key. Automated peak selection, spectrum extraction, and zero charge mass deconvolution is a major advantage. Not only does it relieve the tedium of the operations, but automation ensures consistency, especially in the zero charge mass deconvolution. It's amazing that although essentially all the LCMS system vendors offer a e open access solution that covers sample submission, acquisition, peak picking, and extraction, only two of the competitors we evaluated uh, continued the automation to include the zero charge mass deconvolution, at least when we were doing our evaluation. Of the two, uh, Agilent software was already able to accept protein sequences from the users at time of submission and to automate that annotation based on those sequences without further intervention. I've already shown, shown some examples of this, and this is something that we're pretty excited about and looking and working to improve. I expect uh, that these capabilities will become more common in the future. Uh, the automated sequence acceptance and annotation excited us because of the nature of our group. We're about 25 people here, about half of whom who deal with the protein products at any time and plus a few users from external groups. So say 12 to 15 users a month with varying numbers of samples. We make our own constructs, but we also accept constructs from other sites and external collaborators. So an individual researcher might have to keep track of dozens of protein sequences spread over multiple projects at any given time. In the old uh, analyst-centered model, the sequence would be another thing to submit and another potential point of failure that would require time-consuming follow-up when observed masses don't match calculated masses. Integrating sequence analysis into the automated process allows uh, and requires the users to manage their own sequences, which overall is a much better idea. We've implemented open access on Agilent 6530 QTOF with a 1290 UHPLC system in front but a lot of what I've discussed can be done on lower resolution instruments as well. Another thing that we selected that improves the capabilities and flexibility of the system is the six column selector and dual temperature zone uh, column oven. This allows us to have separate protein and peptide columns and also separate columns for antibodies that can be held at a different higher temperature than the other columns. The advantage of this is that we can offer protein, peptide, and antibody methods all in the same system. Of course, only one sample can be run at a time, but the point is that different users with different needs can queue up their diverse samples, and the system will work through them without intervention.
I'll talk more about peptide methods later, but the flexibility of application of the overall system is a real advantage. So our intact mass automation easily saves five to 10 analyst minutes per sample. Our first year of the system in 2012, we ran nearly 2,400 samples over 11 months. And even at a conservative five minute per sample estimate, that's nearly 200 FTE hours saved for a skilled analyst. This year, we're on track to double usage, uh, and we expect it to continue to grow into the future. In the old days, we might run maybe 80 samples a month, and it's, that's simply because the sample submission process plus skilled analyst turnaround times were kind of daunting and, and less rewarding for users. It often took too long to get data for purification process monitoring unless you made prearrangements with the analyst. Large sample sets presented their own problems when everything was done manually. At other Novartis sites where open access is more established, 10 to 20,000 protein samples per year per system is not uncommon. And so you think about the manual analysis time that you save with an automated system. It's worth noting that we don't really want to get close to full capacity because part of open access is allowing users to get their results in a timely manner. If your sample is always at the end of an hours long or days long queue, even with automation, then the utility overall is diminished. This is something that you have to manage. The upper limits though, in terms of number of samples, are almost certainly much higher than we are seeing right now, even at 50% utilization. So to summarize open access, it reduces the burden of sample submission and the turnaround time to usable results. It also increases the overall availability of the resource. In doing so, the skilled analyst becomes more of an enabler and less of a gatekeeper. End users start thinking about the technique differently. Skilled analysts then also become more free to make contributions in other ways. In the research environment, very few of us have dedicated technical roles. I'm a protein chemist and I'm judged primarily on my project contributions and not my support roles. And unfortunately, uh, protein intact mass support is a support role. Uh, if you're in a dedicated analytical role, you will be able to support more users and more samples and more systems. And you might even be able to support additional techniques because of the time saved. In summary, the open access really changes intact protein mass spectrometry from a service to a tool. So let me move on to a few case studies about how open access makes certain kinds of applications less tedious and more accessible, in some real sense, more practical. In this example, a user wanted to provide a homogeneously unphosphorylated protein to her team. It was expressed heterogeneously phosphorylated in insect cells, but in vitro dephosphorylation was only moderately successful and it had poor yields. Because this user had the ability to analyze all her different purification fractions, she was able to develop a protocol that resulted in homogeneous material. You see here on the right that the initial protein pool she had separated into two peaks on the first ion exchange column. Each of those two peaks was still heterogeneous. The one peak containing unphosphorylated material was further purified on high resolution ion exchange column to get the homogeneous pool. This kind of development, this kind of uh, research process development is quite challenging without protein mass spectrometry. And it's faster and easier when you have open access. Here's a recent example about covalent inhibitors. Covalent protein modifiers have been coming up a lot for me recently, so I like this example. I trained a scientist from another group for about five minutes on login instructions and method selection and sample preparation. This scientist was able to train his summer intern who acquired the data you see here. Neither of them had to know about LCE or MS or zero charge mass protein deconvolutions. And I didn't have to sit there and analyze all their raw data for them. They were able to prepare their samples and receive these deconvolutions, which they used to study the kinetics of covalent adduct formation. I haven't shown the tabular data with peak heights or areas of the zero charge mass deconvolution, but that information is what they used to study the kinetics. Germel showed an example in his uh, presentation earlier. These users felt that it was so successful 
that they extended their experiments to cover a whole family of covalent inhibitors of the same protein. And I'm told it's the main in vitro assay being used in this project right now. Later on, we uh, went even further and analyzed some of their samples by triptych digest in order, and LCMSMS in order to confirm the site of modification on the protein. In those cases, I provided a digestion protocol and just told them which LCMSMS method to select under Oakman Access in order to acquire their data. I didn't have to spend any other time with them up front, and then later on, I just met with them to uh, do the data analysis. That's an example of being able to support more techniques and applications because of Open Access. Here's an example of my own work. This is a system where a kinase is phosphorylating its substrate twice, corresponding to full activation. We're able to monitor this activation by protein intact mass at multiple time points. On the left, we see the control experiment where complete, nearly complete phosphorylation is, a, is achieved by 35 minutes. And on the right, we see the experimental condition, uh, a compound which is binding to the substrate as opposed to the kinase greatly slows the double phosphorylation. At 35 minutes, you see that the com with the compound present, only partial single phosphorylation is observed, and even at 120 minutes, it's not complete. The reduced data analysis demands that, that come with open access make this kind of experiment a lot less tedious and more appealing to do. Imagine if you had to manually process all these samples. The open access automation enables multiple replicates of this experiment with multiple compounds and multiple time points to be done within a reasonable amount of time and a greatly reduced amount of effort. Here's another experiment that I did recently. I was studying a specific phosphorylation of a protein by kinase because I wanted to be able to produce the fully singly phosphorylated protein in vitro. We were having trouble finding conditions where a high percentage of the phosphorylation would occur. What I did was I set up reactions and time points on the open access and monitored the phosphorylation progress by peak heights from the deconvolutions. Uh, since the data analysis is automated, I'm simply just recording the peak heights uh, in Excel and calculating the percentage phosphorylation and plotting it versus time. In this data, you see at the upper left, atypical behavior of a kinase, where I observed that different kinase concentrations at the same substrate concentration led to different plateaus of percent phosphorylation. You would normally expect a different phosphorylation rates for the different kinase concentrations, but the same plateau. At the upper right, I found that lower substrate concentrations actually led to more complete phosphorylation. These two results suggest something unusual happening like product or substrate in inhibition. At the lower left, I saw also that long reaction times, for instance, overnight, led to partial reversal of the phosphorylation. Um, I didn't know what this was, but it could be perhaps a reversible kinase reaction. The data shown here wasn't really enough to fully explain what was going on, but it was enough to enumerate conditions where I could completely phosphorylate the protein in vitro, and this turns out to be enabling for the project. Here, let me give a couple of examples of how peptide LCMS and LCMSMS can be automated in open access. In this slide, we're looking at the same experiment as on slide 41, but at the peptide level. It turns out that the two sites of phosphorylation on the protein substrate happen to occur on the same triptych peptide, which makes this analysis possible in this way. So first, I use LCMSMS data acquisition on the open access system to identify accurate mass retention time pairs for the two possible singly phosphorylated versions of the peptide substrate. The mass is the same, but retention times differ based on the site of phosphorylation. I then use peptide LCMS under the open access system to monitor phosphorylation of the two sites. I should note here that the entire submission and analysis workflow was automated. I could submit the substrate sequence along with the samples, and Agilent's molecular feature extraction algorithm seems to work pretty well with digests and can be included in the automated workflow. What it does is it analyzes the full LCMS data set and builds a compound list. That compound list is then matched against the sequence and results, including the equivalent of peak heights or areas uh, of an XIC or similar 
chromatogram, and that data is output in the report. At that point, I only need to uh, record those intensities, whether they be heights or areas of the peptides of interest in the table, and then make the plots you see here. You see in the control experiment on the, on the left, the unphosphorylated peptide in blue declines rapidly as the first phosphorylation site in red rises up. And then the first phosphorylation site in red declines again as the second site is phosphorylated. The double phosphorylated peptides in purple, and what this shows is that the phosphorylation is ordered. With the compound treatment, however, on the right, Remember, the compound is binding to the substrate, not the kinase, and we see that the activation is slowed. In fact, only site 1 is significantly phosphorylated by the end of the experiment. It doesn't seem to have changed the order of phosphorylation at all, which was a question that we had on the project. Another peptide application we've set up in open access is LCMSMS for protein ID. Again, we give users protocols for digestions and have already set up MSMS methods available in open access. Users need simply submit the digest samples that they prepare and se select an applicable method. In the case of mascot database searches, uh, MassHunter can directly export the MSMS spectra into the standard mascot generic format files, which can be searched by the end user manually. But you can see uh, clearly that using mascot daemon or mascot distiller, it would be easy to fully automate the whole process, causing the completed LCMSMS run to automatically be searched against the relevant databases and return results to the user without further intervention. In the application of confirming the identity of our recombinant protein products produced in the research environment, you can see how the combination of intact mass plus LCMSMS of a proteolytic digest can be combined to produce a very strong version of protein confirmation. Not only intact mass, but internal sequence information as well is provided in that combined experiment. The intact mass by itself does in fact have some loopholes and so the combination of the two approaches helps close those loopholes. We're starting to do this more routinely because open access makes it easier. In closing, protein intact mass is an essential tool in the production, quality control, and characterization of recombinant proteins. Intact mass provides unique, specific information about the molecular state of proteins. Peptide MS and MSMS adds additional detail to this. Open access re reduces the burden on trained analysts and allows increased support of users, applications, and projects by fixed FTE resources. But most importantly, open access increases a scientist's understanding of her proteins and produ provides additional opportunities to contribute to project success. I want to thank especially my partner in this effort, Dodd Zetang of Analytical Sciences. I also want to thank our respective group heads, Gavin Dollinger and Isabel Zoror, as well as Harry Kelly and John in Emeryville and the Novartis Global Head of Analytical Sciences, Stephen Martin. At Agilent, Xiaoling, Robert, Maitley, Ed, and Wilfred were on the software side helping out, Ning and Andy with application support, and Jose, Kristen, and Dong Hui with sales and post-sales support. And of course, taken for leadership and support at Agilent in working with us at Novartis. And thank you all for your time and attention. Thanks, Eric. Before we start the Q&A session, I just want to give you a final call on the questions for our panelists. Uh, please submit your questions now. I also want to let you know that a post-webinar survey will deploy shortly in the presentation manager. Please take a few minutes and respond. Your comments are extremely valuable to us. Okay, let's start our Q&A session. We have a lot of good questions already, and we'll answer as many as we can. Our first questions are for Gamil. Um, Gamil, can the Mass Hunter walk-up LCMS software work with TOF instruments, or is it specifically designed for QTOF? Uh, thanks, Emily. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the Mass Hunter walk-up software will work with TOF instruments. And as I mentioned in my summary slide, uh, the TOF is probably better suited for uh, routine analysis downstream that does not require MSMS capabilities like, for example, if you are looking at routine uh, intact mass uh, confirmation. Uh, if you're looking at peptide mapping to make sure that you got the right sequence coverage or 
profiling some common post-translational modification like oxidation, clipping, like lysine truncation. All right, here's another one. What analyses are amenable to the Mass Hunter open access software? Um, I think Eric covers some of those applications in very detail in his uh, part of the presentation. Um, uh, some of the applications that one can transfer to open access framework uh, include like Again, intact mass confirmation, I think, which is one of the most tested attributes in this industry. Um, for example, when you're expressing protein, you want to make sure that it has the right mass. Um, again, uh, Eric covered this in quite some details in his talk. Um, also looking at or monitoring modifications like phosphorylation, uh, which again Eric covered in his uh, talks, oxidation clipping, and of course, uh, peptide mapping. All right. Um, is the Mass Hunter Open Access solution transferable to quality control in biopharma? Hey, that's a good question. Um, the current version of the Mass Hunter software uh, was designed for routine mass spec analysis for non mass spec experts in discovery to routine characterization labs. Um, but having said that, Open Access setups does make it very, very compelling for transfer to a more regulated environment like the quality control departments, let's say for product release, and uh, making Mass Hunter walk-up solutions compliant to 21 CFR Part 11 and GMP environment is definitely in our product development uh, plan uh, for future software releases. All right, thanks, Kamil. Um Eric, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is, how can how sure can you be that your protein is what you think it is based on intact mass alone? It seems to me that it can't be certain. Um, yeah, that's true. Thanks, Tamlin. Um, that's true. Uh, I think I, I was trying to emphasize in the earlier part of my talk that um, the, the confidence you have is the result of your entire um, experimental process, in the case of recombinant proteins, the cloning expression and purification process than the fact then that you have a uh, observed intact mass that can be explained by your primary protein primary sequence. That's, that whole process is what gives you the confidence there. Um, and then if you need additional uh, level of confirmation, then you can do some uh, peptide-based uh, MSMS in combination with that intact mass uh, data to give you a uh, very high high degree of confidence. But intact mass by itself is not perfect. It's true. All right, so here's another intact mass, qu mass question. Are there proteins or protein sizes which can't be measured by intact mass? Um, I haven't encountered one yet. Um, if you look in the literature, certainly for uh, native protein complexes, some very large uh, complexes can be examined by intact mass. But what we're talking about here mostly is recombinant proteins, which range uh, certainly up to 250 kilodaltons. We've, we've uh, successfully measured before. Um, uh, antibodies, of course, are in the range of 150 kilodaltons. It is true, too, that um, as the uh, protein size or the primary sequence length increases, you do lose some signal, and there's uh, more tendencies to uh, retain uh, ions or uh, solvent molecules in ion clusters, which kind of uh, reduces the fidelity of your primary data, the M over Z spectrum, and sometimes introduces uh, complications in uh, generating your zero charge mass deconvolution. So there are practical limitations, but uh, there, as a as a, a practical matter. I'm not sure what the upper limit really is, and we haven't really run into that as a, as a big problem uh, in our lab. Okay, here's another intact mass question. How do you deal with glycosylation in intact mass? So glycosylation is um, one of the more complicated sets of modifications to deal with, and this has to do with the fact that at a single site, you can have a, a, a really big variety of possible structures and possible uh, compositions for that structure. Um, sometimes it's, it's easier to deal with, like in the case of uh, IgG molecules, I think uh, something like 12 
structures and compositions of glycosylation explain like 90% of the observed glycosylation for IgG. Um, but in other um, cases, it's, it's much more complicated. For instance, we express a lot of larger extracellular domains, and some of these uh, proteins become hyperglycosylated. Maybe a 50 kilodalton protein primary sequence might include 10 to 20 kilodaltons of glycosylation, which is quite heterogeneous. In, in some of those cases, it's difficult even to get an interpretable signal. You might have, instead of a nice uh, multiply charged state envelope uh, in the M over Z spectra, you might just get a big unresolved hump of signal. And that actually happens pretty commonly with those types of proteins. And then uh, intact mass is not helpful at that point. But um, even if uh, you can't interpret the specific uh, identity of the composition or structure of the glycosylation, a lot of times it is moderate enough that you can use it as a, uh, as a batch control. So if you express the same protein from one batch to another, you want to see the same pattern of glycosylation. But it does uh, sometimes make it difficult to confirm the primary sequence uh, when the protein is still glycosylated. Okay, Eric, here's another one. What do you think your sample throughput is, and how fast can you run samples? Um, most of the data I showed had, was uh, acquired with acquisition, full LC-MS acquisition times of three and a half or five minutes. Um, and even those at those uh, uh, acquisition times, basically like 30-second gradients on, on these columns, you're able to get some degree of separation of protein species. For instance, the, the uh, heavy and reduced heavy and light chain antibody that I showed, that was a three and a half minute run. You can get clear separation between the heavy and light chain. So um, the throughput then is probably on the order of 12 to 20 per, uh, per hour uh, in principle. Uh, at the moment, the practical limitation is the uh, data analysis, which happens in uh, series with the uh, data acquisition, and that often takes longer for uh, more complicated samples. Okay, Eric, we have a listener who says, I'm very interested in the field of protein therapeutics. Considering that you have well-characterized proteins, what is the rate of attrition for these types of therapies? What are the critical steps? Well, I, I think uh, given the tenor of the question, I, I can't really say um, what it is uh, in terms of uh, clinical uh, attrition. Uh, I think there's uh, good reviews and literature out there. Um, in the research stage, it really does depend on uh, on what kind of program you're talking about. When you when you're doing antibodies, you generate often tens or hundreds of candidates for a particular antibody target you're talking about. So then, clearly, the attrition rate is is very high. Maybe only one antibody in the end is going to go into the clinic, go into humans. Um, for uh, other kinds of protein therapeutics, a lot of times you have a pretty well-defined target. So um, the attrition rate in the research stage is much lower, probably. If you have like a small cytokine, well, the, the sequence and identity is pretty much defined for you. So it's either 0% or 100% in the research stage. When you're making uh, receptor fusions, for instance, you might go through a few rounds of uh, engineering and, and validation. Uh, but uh, the, the, again, the attrition rate is, is higher than for a small molecule drug program, but we're, we're really talking research here. So it's uh, not, not as, the success rate is not as high for individual protein constructs as for uh, uh, clinical programs. I hope that makes sense. All right, Eric, I have a question from a, a master's student in biotech. Um, they're wondering, is this for the entire lab use, or can it be used for individual independent research as a student? Do you want to um, tackle that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, 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 the purpose of open access is to have it available to as many people as possible who, who, who can make use of it. Um, uh, from time to time, we, we, we remind people who might not normally use the system that it's there and available to them, and, and we actually hope that, that more people uh, 
at the site will will make use of it as many as possible. So um, uh, sometimes we do have uh, students, as I mentioned in one of my slides, uh, one of the questions or one of the uh, the examples was was based on data largely acquired by a summer intern, um, and sometimes we have interns at the not just at the college level, but even even the high school level. And I think uh, we would be happy to have uh, those students uh, use the system. All right, Eric. As you answer questions, people have more questions, so I'm sorry to bombard you. But here's another one: Can you estimate and find the location of AB drug conjugants on an antibody using this method? Um. The, based on intact mass by itself, it doesn't really doesn't give inf uh, information about the site of modification. Uh, clearly, depending on the specific kinds of conjugation methods uh, you're using, you might then, based on the number of uh, con conjugates you observe, have ideas about where they might be. For instance, with the commonly used uh, cysteine chemistries. Uh, the amine chemistries, often you don't have a particular idea just because there's so many possible sites of modification. So you would need to follow up with um, other kinds of analyses, uh, often in involving mass spec like uh, uh, peptide MSMS uh, after digestion or sometimes limited proteolysis, et cetera, uh, again, with intact mass analysis. Okay, Eric, we have time for one last question. Um, I would like to see the LC-TIC recombinant protein samples are usually heterogeneous with variants, missing MET, oxidation, et cetera, that may appear in the tails of the main protein peak. I don't see a question there. Do you? Um, well, I, I would agree in general that um, recombinant protein uh, peaks are, often have multiple variants, but, but actually we quite often we see that they are um, – molecularly homogeneous too. So um, I mean that's one of the main reasons why we do do the intact mass analysis. We want to see is it one of these ones that are relatively well behaved? Is it another one which we show all the possible and terminal variants for instance? Uh, do we see heterogeneous phosphorylation and, and how much do we need to worry about it? What do we need to do downstream to understand what we're going to put into our assays or put into, into structural analysis? Um, but, I mean, that's the whole point of, of doing uh, intact protein LCMS. Eric, thanks for being such a good sport and answering so many questions. Unfortunately, our time is up. Thanks for listening in, and, and thanks for all the great questions. This webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. Once again, I want to thank our panelists and uh, our sponsor, Agilent Technologies.